Good day. Welcome to Spatial. This is episode eight. Uh, this is uh, the first of March in our part of the world. Helena, our part of the world, will definitely claim it. We're on this side of the international time zone. But for the other three co-hosts, you're still on. Ooh, welcome to Leap Year Day. So 29th of February. Another big week. Um, there's a lot of open AI sort of ramifications still flooding out. And dare I say, Full Vision Pro, what are they calling it? Crack gate? No, there's a few hardware flaws coming from flexing the device and heat. Heat plus flex equals, not really quite sure what the percentage of failures is, but um, yes, the flagship device is slightly flagging. Um, there might be a reaction to that soon. Not really sure. William, can we turn to you first for your fast five? Straight out of the gate. Over to you. Well, certainly. Um, so my fast five is really the front door to a new lab at NVIDIA, at, at NVIDIA um, called GEAR, which stands for Generalist Embodied Agent Research, and it's led by Dr. Jim Fan and Professor UK Shu. And um, I, think the, I think the spirit of this Fast Five is more like a, a research group to, um, to watch. Uh, as they start to formalize their work. It's an extension of the work that they've been doing for several years. But I think the the interesting part about this, which is related somewhat to a data set that we had in a previous episode, is that a way for sort of spatially aware um, agents, spatially aware models to, to develop is to incorporate both the sort of theoretical and abstract aspects of um, like what large language models um, afford, but also experimentation with the real world. And so they, they make a point about how the combination of observing the real world, but also interacting with the real world is far more effective um, for not only um, AI agents, but also, um, uh, also animals and, uh, and mammals like us. And so I think that that's really fascinating. They they use both examples in the real world, but also virtual worlds like Minecraft to test these theories. And so I think it's really fascinating uh, for them to both be including the reasoning and planning capabilities of large language models and vision uh, with vision language models and uh, real world experimentation. It's pretty wild. It's uh, another one from uh, NVIDIA Research Labs. Uh, I do note with interest there are open positions in this actual team. Um, so this is the team that's doing, well, gamified slash um, excellent 3D simulations. Um, I'm just trying to correlate this with the other amazing news of the week of NVIDIA's uh, share price going through the roof with the fact <laughs> that uh, Sam Altman OpenAI is also trying to you know, raise some trillion dollars to make more GPU chips and the world is powered by GPUs. Um, this is obviously, this uh, research project is obviously highlighting the power, although of a, it's the power of our GPUs, although I must say using Minecraft to highlight the power of a GPU is possibly a bit counterintuitive if you can run it on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Um, what's, the, what's the outcome of, of these labs? They're actually trying to do a uh, common platform or they're doing a lot of multiple part projects to just build up a library of knowledge? It looks like right now a library of knowledge that's an extension of what they've been doing for quite some time. I think the idea is that they'll have um, model architectures for um, robotics in particular that will be able to learn much faster and be far more effective. So I think that's what generally what they're going for. While they're definitely proficient, uh, their projects page has many, many, and pretty much every month they're coming out with something fresh and new. So, um, and of course, some of the dates of the publications are pre-publications. There's one there for uh, in May 2024, which is excellent. Um, human level reward design, essentially uh, the old uh, effort of finger pen spinning 
but writ large in simulations in 3D sims. So um, O to be within NVIDIA and have as many A100s or whatever the next version of their superpower GPU is and have a server farm at your disposal. This must be um, like kids in the candy shop. Merrick, is this sort of, uh, is this sort of uh, technology uh, uh, closeness the thing that you'd be aiming for? Would you be in love and would never be seen again if you had access to this kind of both tech and computing power? Mm. I definitely find it interesting and fascinating, you know, these big pushes and, and big money floating in the industry. But there's also, like, it, especially in terms of NVIDIA, there's a lot of talk about the dangers of a monopoly in, in this, you know, big new field of autonomous robots roaming around. And if everything is NVIDIA, then, you know, that's not very good. So uh, I'm looking at it. I'm sort of headed in the same direction, but I'm not relying so much on one company's ecosystem. I think I think there's there's a lot of need to to open source these things and, and be sort of uh, inter not not really dependent on one particular hardware stack because we've seen that in during the during the COVID pandemic, right? The the supply chain failure and 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 what it caused and PlayStation 5s weren't available, but that's that's more of a laughing matter. That's that's barely an inconvenience. But when it gets to serious business, and you know, when when your industries rely on robotics heavily and autonomous machines, then being dependent on one company is not so good. So I'm looking at all this, and it's fascinating, and it's definitely good that it's happening. Uh, OpenAI's big race is also oh, interesting. It's a lot yep. of money they're asking for, but it might be just negotiation strategy. Uh, I don't really know how to comment on that. It's like you see these these similar stuff happening on, on multiple fronts. Google's uh, Intrinsic is doing pretty much the same thing, with sort of like from my perspective. Oh, good. No, uh, that's a great link, uh, William. We'll put the link in the show notes. And one thing I'd love to highlight uh, is each of these projects has a project page of its own paper and code. Oh, my God, we've got code. So this is definitely um, in type A of releasing everything to the world. Speaking of releasing things to the world, um, Violet, your Fast Five this week is released by another large uh um, uh, corporation, but um, doesn't really have the uh, robots are here to kill us kind of vibe. It has the cute and cuddly and it's going to squash us to death. Do tell. <laughs> yes. Um, this week I'm sharing this video that was released by Toyota Research Institute. Um, they've created a robot, uh, really a research lab. The robot is called Puno. Uh, it's a soft robot for whole body manipulation. They're doing research around that. So it looks a little bit like... Um, oh, it's big hero six, surely. <laughs> it looks like a, a humanoid robot, but I think it's only torso up right now, or most of the research is done with that. Um, and it looks like a kid wearing um, one of those life jackets. You know how they have like... The kids' life jackets have kind of squishy bubble arms. Floaties. Um, so the whole the floaties, yes. Um, so th this robot is covered in kind of maybe inflatable or like pillow-like squishy um, ness. But what's interesting about it, or what they talk about, is that the robot uses the whole body to pick things up. So we've seen a lot of hand grabby robots recently, but this is. Um, carrying larger loads where it's pushing whatever it's carrying with its arms into its torso, more like the way we carry large items. Um, but what I thought was most interesting about it wasn't necessarily that it's using the whole body ergonomics to carry things. Um, it's the fact that these inflatables throughout it um, are actually tactile sensors. Um, and so they talk about that being a big portion of how this learns to carry things, which I think just makes a lot of sense, you know, um, when they look at different models and how good they are at learning tasks like grabbing things and putting things down. 
Um, something that learns only visually doesn't do very well, but if you add tactile sensors, it starts to do really well. Seems obvious, you know, if you didn't have touch in your hand, it would be very hard to know when you had grabbed something. <laughs> um, so I think that's really interesting. Oh, it is. It's, it's great to see. There, it's not fully um, autonomous just yet. There's people off to the side doing the remote uh, manipulation, teleoperation, which is perfectly cool. But they're doing that learning stage of, um, yeah, the shopping bags close to your chest, carrying all the camping gear down to the beach, you know, in one go. Um, you know, is there any uh, person who doesn't try and bring as many shopping bags with them from the car into the house as possible? But those techniques of, of learning using your friction on arms, chest, any part of the body to, you know, bear hug, grip, um, because as they say, they most robots we use now or think about, you know, it's full strength to lift the 200 kilogram weight from A to B. Well, hey, you can just, you know, bear hug it and move it much, much easier. All that friction is just a different way of working and great that they're doing that. It is, it is cute. Sadly, I think the head is not doing a lot. There's no sensors. It's almost just a, yeah, big Hero 6 blow up head on a robot but the learning from the bear hugging is phenomenal. And yeah, must watch video, quite cool. Um, and if they can incorporate that into more robots coming near us, then that's great. Yeah, I'm eager to see if other groups are starting to use both touch sensing and um, video and visuals. Yeah. Well, I'll do my fast five next. It's a bit tangential. Uh, related and I'll use the Big Hero 6 as the as the link between. Uh, Big Hero 6 was the blow up soft medical care robot. Well, not talking robots now, but I'm talking VR, XR. I've got two companies who are doing um, a similar kind of technique and technology, but coming from just at different angles slightly. I've got the Moon Hub or Moon Hub and I've got Blue Room XR. These are two companies who are doing VR-based or XR-based immersive training for different purposes. Uh, Moonhub is doing it to be able to assess a trainee's spatial awareness, timeliness, where they're gazing, how they're reacting. So not just doing, let's say, OHS training or medical care training, doing question and answer. You know, option C is always the statistically best one to choose if you don't know the answer. Do the two professors agree with that? No, they're not acknowledging that at all. Excellent, right, that's fine. I'll keep that to myself a bit longer. Um, they're using VR-based training to actually try and get the trainees more than just knowledge, tick a box, tick and flick, or you know, circle the things on the screen that are, you know, you're gonna fall over. It's assessing them in real time, obviously requires hardware. They've just raised a new round of funding and uh, UK-based, certainly uh, one to watch. Other one is Blue Room um, VR, and they're actually Melbourne-based. They're local to me. I kind of know them, but they're pretty darn awesome. They've come out of a uh, training for paramedics and for emergency responders in the classic training mode, and now they've added this thing called Blue Room. And it's uh, semi-lo-fi. Uh, lo-fi is the phrase you'd use to say low fidelity over XR, basically cardboard box technology. I've seen a bit of this. Maybe not fully cardboard boxes, but you make a scenario or a room or a inside of a vehicle that is made out of cheap and throwaway materials, but it's just enough to give a tactile feel. And then you overlay switches and controls and things like that. They're doing that same thing, low low fi, but upgrading it a bit, not quite high fi. They're overlaying on a state of the art electronic medical patient dummy, just the torso, and they're using that to overlay. Um, ailments, uh, cuts, abrasions, heart attack, simulating any uh, scenario they can think of. But the added bonus is that they're doing it in a completely blue room, which well, it doesn't have to be blue, but it's a great marketing plan and definitely um, iconic. Um, they're overlaying scenarios so that when two people and they're doing it as a as a um, as a as a pair um, of medics are. Um, assessing a patient, that patient can be on the ground at in a battlefield, they can be in the back of an airplane being transported, back of an ambulance, you know, around the corner from a combat scene. Blue Room is doing it for defence-ish related kind of fields and putting the uh, trainees, in this case the medics, under some serious stress to make their world very chaotic and can they still 
care for the patient uh, with unknown scenarios and all, all sorts of things that can throw at them, both medical issues as well as um, everyone's safety and things going off around them. So two companies that are both doing VR-based training to enhance the training scenarios. And the nice thing is, once you've got the headset, that's the asterisk. And once you've got the software, they can just like the matrix, like the loading zones, transport you to a different location and then start a new scenario there. So you can ramp up a lot. I know my son is doing his um, training in uh, medical fields and they do dummy training too. It's just a room and they say, imagine you are at a car crash. You come across this patient on the table. Well, it wouldn't be on the table be on the floor it wouldn't even be on the floor it would be in worse position so this lets them put in pretty dire situations quickly and no doubt seriously stress out the knowledge of the people being trained phenomenal technology and um yeah doing it singly or in pairs is definitely the way forward any thoughts there they are the the, the people from um uh the blue room are doing a lot of international conference circuits and but they basically give the headset to people and say patient dying fix and i think the success rate of the patient is not very good but it's only a silicon dummy so it's fine have you had any uh training like that or have you um had uh, situations where your interactive xrvr has gone into that educational realm is that something that's you've seen a bit of so far team no, I've seen more actual still um, in-person training scenarios where something like that would be super useful. Like what comes to mind immediately is a, um, a skipper training a company we work with locally and they do all kinds of sea survival, sea rescue training, you know, fire emergency training on board large vessels, but it's always actually executed you know so someone actually goes overboard and someone actually jumps in and goes after them and i feel like that probably prepares you for the real deal more adequately um than a vr alternative maybe it's different if you've got the silicone dummy that you can practice your cpr on but when it comes to actually like jumping into rushing cold water i don't really think that's so replicable so perhaps there are some scenarios that's more suitable for then i wonder you know what's the what's it replacing like for instance an autopilot is a perfectly good um, training facility for a pilot but like perhaps the emergency scenario for the skipper isn't so um, you know I'm sure there are it's definitely application fields where something like that can give people a huge amount of hands-on experience without needing to go into such um, you know expensive training without having to perhaps travel quite far for training without needing perfect conditions and so on so I think it's definitely cool but it has its limitations would be my thoughts on that yeah it's a uh, scale from how real versus how much can you reset it how many times in one hour can you do that training and where's the value curve yeah mm. obviously jumping overboard is uh hopefully only uh, only a one or two times per day event surely <laughs> uh, i'm not the one jumping so you know <laughs> i'm just there to film <laughs> that's oh very good so that's a someone else excellent it's good to watch someone else do that <laughs> Uh, yeah. Top work. Mirek, for you, Fast Five, we have a Stretch 3 uh, realistic home robot. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to mention something briefly that will sort of bridge us and take us through this topic that we want to talk about, and, and that is how to get started in this, in this business, in this industry. But this is a robotics platform, and if you remember uh, Mobile Aloha, uh, fascinating video we covered some time ago. So they had these two manipulators and a person training the robot on the spot to actually be able to perform these, these highly dexterous tasks like folding a t-shirt, cooking a meal and stuff like that. So uh, a company called Hello Robot just upgraded their development platform, which is called Stretch3. And you can imagine it as a chunky Roomba size robot on wheels that has this pole sticking out of it and on top of that there's this uh, there's this telescopic arm that can that can expand and retract and on top of that there's a there's a manipulator that can gripper that can grip stuff they just upgraded this thing with with more dexterous wrist and a better depth camera so that's the upgrade it's not gonna blow your mind it's just iteration on something but you can get this thing to 
get going to to get into the industry and start experimenting with you know manipulating things it's open source it runs ROS, so you'll get your your geometry and you know you can detect what objects are and then you can do your thing which is that's the magic sauce right that's that's kind of what we're talking about but this allows you to get going the thing is out I wanted to mention that if you want two arms, you need two of these things. So two Roombas separately, uh, sort of navigating around your space with two big arms. It can carry two kilos, they say, and each of these machines weighs about 25 kilos. The price tag is 25,000 US for one. So it's just, I'm, I'm trying to sort of open a topic here, because if you want to do something that Mobile Aloha did, you built a platform out of parts, like one of those arms they used is like three, three, three and a half thousand US. This is not crazy, you know, if you're, if you're serious about it, it requires some capital. This thing is 25,000, you need two of them, and then you do the work on your software or on your on your uh you know machine learning and all that uh the other way to get going is to build is to look at what the offering is you know companies like like hello robot and try to build something like that yourself which is entire topic entirely different topic but i wanted to mention this because it's an interesting uh entry to you know if you want to if you feel like doing something like what mobile aloha us or did or presented and you're not really strong on the hardware side you need to get something like that or find somebody who can help you build something like that i, I just found it quite interesting that you know this 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 platform is, is meant for research and, and development they say it's kind of ready to go in the real world but it's more like a research tool really the price tag is really interesting it won't blow your mind it doesn't look like a human it looks like you know bare bones machine uh, uh, you got FedExed to your door next week, yeah, which is the benefit. Yeah, no, it's mm -hmm. it, it, it has looking like yeah, you're right. It's a Roomba with a um, 3D printer X Y Z um, on top. It's not a joints, elbows, wrists. It's the vertical Z axis, the how far left, how far right. So by all means, that simplifies a lot of things. I'm hardened to see that it can do two kilogram carrying capacity at different times. That's normally the first thing that goes when you get a uh, in the box, all in one prototype, my first robot. It, it's, uh, its load capacity is limited. You know, you're basically doing, you know, to lift foam blocks around as opposed to things that are quote unquote meaningful. So yeah, I'm glad to see that it has some heft to it. Might make FedExing another bill to get to your front door but certainly that's uh, you're right if the price point is we all cringed that's okay but at the same time to do something yourself of that nature would be could be double the price or could be half the price but could you trust it and your own soldering so this is a guaranteed way forward nice one all righty team we're going to leave fast five there we'll uh come back and we're going to come back and this time we're not coming back in this episode. We're going to come back with a deep dive on the next episode. Don't panic. Should be hitting your uh, episode, your podcast um, application within moments after this one. And we're going to get the deep dive of the topic of how do you get started in spatial AI. We're going to come back with that one on the next one. So we'll catch you there. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 If you'd like more news and insights about spatial AI or have a story or interesting topic you'd like us to cover, reach out to us. Or better yet, come and join the community at Spatial. All the links are in the show notes.